thanks for having me back. Um, the um, you know the the series name has has changed slightly because um, I think as I kind of get the the material together and actually create these presentations, um, only then does kind of a logical structure sort of uh, present itself. Uh, and so remember at the end of the the last lecture, I asked if it would be appropriate for me to extend this into a, a four seminar series rather than three. Rabbit was uh, kind enough to let me do that. And so the, the structure has changed. Uh, it used to be these three subheadings. Um, the first two have really turned out to be both introductions to the seminal archetype, where the first one was really just establishing nomenclature and conventions, and the second one was um, discussing uh, portfolio compositions in, in N dimensions. So these are both completed. And the one that we're going to be doing today, um, I've called concentrated prototypes. Uh, virtual tokens and augmented hyperbolas, um, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be handling both two-dimensional and n-dimensional um, spaces, which means that the the fourth slot is still going to be the exotic bonding curve types, and I'm going to put in some additional um, theory that kind of buttresses the things that you've already seen. So we'll be returning to some of the um, the material presented in the last three lectures that I said that I would eventually return to things like um, an AMM as a uh, as a depth book or as a, a liquidity book and you know how to use fees um, and then also using different types of um, invariant functions that give you you know different types of slippage profiles or um, you know, um, price impact profiles and we'll discuss exactly what those words mean in that one as well. Um, so today, really, yeah, just focusing on, on concentrated liquidity prototypes. Um, but I think I need to correct a couple of things that I uh, that I said in the last lecture. These are all very, very minor. Um, the first one is that on um, on this slide, I had neglected um, to uh, to substitute out some of the old syntax for the the new syntax. So this is you know this Rx should have been Ri, this Ry should have been Rj, and so on. Um, so nothing too dramatic. Um, and then I caught this while I was presenting the, um, in one of the homework solutions, uh, this is the one where you're removing liquidity um, in two tokens simultaneously. This should be a, a minus sign. So there was a sign in version all the way through this solution. And I apologize for that. Um, and so you can see, I'm just uh, listing out exactly where those sign in versions occurred on the slides and listing the, um, the, the recording play times um, in case anyone needs to, or anyone has um, been going through trying to um, perform some of this work themselves and ended up getting stuck. So that sign in version was there and that's basically the end of the mistakes. Um, let me know if you if there are any others that, um, you know, I, I am fallible and I would be very happy to, um, to address these things as they come up. Okay, so moving on today's, um, with today's lecture, I have constructed a, um, a cheat sheet um, for essentially all of the material that we have discussed up until this point. Uh, this includes all of the reserve um, invariant um, components, the add and remove liquidity components, the trading components, and the exchange rate equilibration. Um, I've noticed, uh, so uh, both uh, Rabbit and Octopus have sent me some um, initial attempts at, at completing some of the homework from, from last week. And I noticed in some of their notes that they're, um, you know, saying that they need to have a look into the the balancer white paper in order to get the in given out and out given in swap equations. And I just wanted to point out that these trade by source and trade by target equations are those equations, right? There is no, um, there is actually no difference between balancer and Bancor V1. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I try to not add, not ask any questions that I haven't already prepared you for. You, there should be no need to, um, to you know, find any other material somewhere else. Obviously you can do that. I encourage you to do that, um, but don't feel like, you know, there's any, um, you know, any prerequisite knowledge to, to these lectures other than um, a fairly developed um, command over uh, algebra and, um, and geometry to understand them. Okay, so, uh, in that vein, uh, let's have a look at uh, this homework assignment. 
which was that you know I, I presented um, a situation where uh, we create a, a liquidity pool under a certain state, and then we allow the oracle prices to change. And then the um, I, I showed you that it's possible to create a series of of swaps um, that will bring the entire portfolio into agreement with whatever that oracle price is. And so the question was then, if we allow the oracle price to change a second time, which in here I've let um, everything equal a dollar, then the question is, how can you know how can we rebalance it um, again? And so this is that uh, that price equilibration equation that that are um, that I presented in the last lecture, and <clears throat> the first thing that you should realize is that this constant term c. Um, is calculable immediately, right? If you've got all of the reserve balances and all of the reserve ratios, then it's possible to um, to get this value out relatively easily. Um, I generate most of my um, numbers to 100 decimal places just because, you know, Python allows me to do that. Um, but, you know, obviously you'll get some rounding errors if you're using fewer significant places. Um, I think the IEEE standard is only 15 or 18 significant figures. Um, and so just know that your... Um, your, um, your accuracy is going to be no better than um, essentially what you would get on a, um, a fixed point system on Ethereum, for example. Um, so if you've got the accuracy, why not use it? Um, and so I'm just you know, reporting all of the digits that I have available. Once we get to that position, we need to start sort of moving through the rest of this equation. Um, PI and PK are obviously referring to the Oracle prices. And I think now is a good time to, um, to revisit um, what the price convention is for the specific equation. Remember that the, the price of any token, let's say that this was, um, it was ETH, the, uh, we need to invert the Oracle price in order to get the amount of ETH per dollar rather than dollars per ETH. Now, in this particular case, and this is the reason why I set them all to $1, is that it doesn't matter, right? Because one over one is the, the same as just one itself. But had I chosen um, any Oracle price other than the number one, um, then this inversion might have messed you up. Um, so just, just remember that. This is very important for this specific equation. Obviously, if you wanted to, um, you could report it in the, the familiar dollars per token um, uh, syntax. And that would mean that this uh, PI and PK is just the inverse of itself. So it would be RIC over PI and RK over PK. Um, but you get some other weird artifacts when you're trying to use this in other contexts. So it's it's you know the the way that I quote these these price conventions is deliberate. Um, and so just you know it's better to adhere to them while you're sort of dealing with the the material that I present. And if you decide that you want to adopt the other convention, you become aware of these kinds of um, these kinds of edge cases, then that that's fine. So the um, Oracle price figured out, now it's just a matter of dealing with these reserve ratios, which of course are all listed here. So not too difficult. Um, and that means that we can um, at least start stepping through this, uh, this part of the equation. So we've already got C, um, we've got the Oracle prices for all of the, the tokens in the system, and we've got all their reserve weights. So just multiplying that uh, value that we had before by this new value that we've calculated gives us this new constant. And then once we've got that, we can actually just start stepping through each row of the, the table and, um, and calculating what the reserve balance should be at these Oracle prices. So here, if we've got the A token, then XPA is going to be equal to, you know, P of A, which is $1, uh, or the inverse of $1 rather, times 0 0.2 times whatever this constant is. Um, and we just do that for the rest of the table in order to generate um, all of these reserve balances. So if you got this far, then I think that that's a pretty satisfactory result, right? I've, I've given you a, a, you know, a, a new equation. Um, it's got a bunch of different um, parameters in there that you need to become familiar with. So if you got to just a, a balanced state for this table, I'd say that that's, that's good, at least, at least you know, half marks or something like that. But remember, the question is actually, how do you rebalance the pool, right? What are the arbitrage steps? And there's more than one way that you can answer it because I haven't actually given you any uh, details about specific implementation. So if we, all we're doing is looking at a, um, you know, a state that the pool was and a state that the, the pool needs to be in, then 
one of the things that you can do is actually just compare those two states. And if we have a smart contract that allows us to, um, to move between states in a multi-token sense, then you can just note that, you know, there's a certain number of tokens going in and a certain number of tokens going out. This I would say is, you know, good enough for full marks, right? You're, you're just pointing out that, um, you know, you need to swap these, these tokens in these quantities and receive these tokens in these quantities. And now the pool is in a balanced state. Um, however, it is very uncommon. In fact, I can't, I'm not sure if there are any examples where the smart contracts actually do allow for swaps by sets. Um, more often than not, the only thing that you can do is swap one token for one other destination token. And this is a much more difficult uh, problem to solve. So here um, I have one of these possible solutions. For example, um, you know, we can start by uh, looking at the, uh, the XE token and just swap everything that we need and get out you know, one of these other A tokens. But then notice that after that, I actually then get a second amount of the XA token later on by swapping a different token in. And there are certain things that should be going through your mind right now. Like, okay, if, if I swapped E for A and then D for B, like, was this necessary? Because now I've got some B here that I now need to put, like, I just took all of this B out of the system and now I'm putting it back into the system in order to get this A out, right? Like these are, um, you know, there are certainly um, efficiency problems with the, with the solution that I've um, proposed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a more efficient result. So as a sort of food for thought, just a special challenge if you want to, um, if you want to do it, um, I've got this challenge, which is construct a visual proof that for any liquidity pool with n dimensions, that there exists a state where um, all of the marginal rates um, agree with the oracle price, and that that state can be reached in at most n minus one discrete, um, you know, token to token swaps. This is a this is uh, actually like if you if you start to wrestle with it, um, it's not too difficult to achieve. There is a, a a very nice visual proof for this, and as a as a hint, um, if you start thinking about like a small number of dimensions first, you will then realize that, um, you know, the way that these manifolds build um, is actually quite, it's, it's trivial to demonstrate this. Um, but the, the method that I have, um, you will always generate the solution in at most n minus one, um, n, n minus one swaps, not all general methods will. Um, so there's actually an infinite number of ways you can, um, you can rebalance this pool. And that brings me to, <clears throat> Um, another um, another question. So I've just answered this first one for you, which is how many arbitrage paths are available. If you include, you know, um, iterative um, or you know, uh, sort of like Newton Rafston sort of uh, approximations that slowly uh, that you know perform a swap and then reanalyze the system, you can do this an infinite number of times. But what if you said that you wanted to do it sort of in, you know, in in bulk? How many arbitrage paths are available by swaps only? Um, and then moving on, what if, um, as the arbitrageur, the person who is rebalancing this pool is only allowed to redeem pool tokens, right? Remember in the case that, um, that, uh, I've, I showed you in, uh, the first lecture that if you've got pool tokens in, um, in this system, it's not like Uniswap where you have to withdraw both tokens simultaneously. You can withdraw any token, right? By itself. And that causes the price to change. Um, and so, you know, when we are looking at these arbitrage steps, we assumed that you know the um, the, the the overall pool size had to remain the same, um, but that's that assumption isn't necessarily true. We can balance this pool by changing its liquidity levels. Um, so you know it is uh, I think worthwhile to assume that maybe you are the only LP in this pool, and rather than let someone arbitrage against you, instead you're just going to withdraw liquidity from some of these units. Um, and what would that look like? Um, another one, so this one I think is maybe uh, slightly easier to answer than the third one, which is what if you're only allowed to mint pool tokens, right? Can you get the pool into a balanced state just by contributing tokens as liquidity to certain reserves and bringing it back up to that level? Now, the reason why these, these get slightly more difficult is that you can't use the equation 
um, that I gave you before, because that one assumes that the pool is staying, um, ha has a static size and all we're doing is adjusting the levels. But there's still something in there that I think that you'll be able to, um, to, to gather from um, the equation itself that will help you uh, answer some of these problems. And then the, um, the fourth one is, um, can you take some of these um, learnings and then turn them into a Python class that actually allows you to, to switch up between some of these methods? Because you could imagine that, especially if you are the, like the administrator of a system um, or maybe, you know, um, you know, maybe a vault manager um, for, you know, a, a, a DAO's treasury or something, um, you might be, you might want to uh, calculate what the most efficient path is for, for rebalancing a pool. Um, including things like gas costs and stuff like that, um, or, you know, the likelihood of being front run or whatever. And so being able to have access both to swaps, liquidity provision and removal functionality when you're rebalancing is, is something that is certainly worth the effort of, um, of studying. Okay, so today's lecture, concentrated prototypes. So we're going to be building very, very quickly on a lot of the um, the bedrock that we have um, that we've laid out in the in the previous two lectures, um, and so I will be revisiting some of the concepts as we go. Um, but in general, I'm going to assume that you are very very familiar, very um, you know very happy with everything that's been that's been presented. And I'm going to move into more sort of a geometric intuition for what it even means to be um, you know a concentrated uh, liquidity system. So you'll remember that these um, these formulas are the ones uh, on the left um, that appeared in the um, Bankwell's original patent. Um, and I swapped these out for the modern convention. I'm now gonna show you um, Bankwell's second patent, which is uh, which was published in 2020. Um, and it looks very, very different. So this is li literally the text of the, um, of the document. Um, and the way that virtually amplified liquidity is presented is like this. And again, this is because you have to remember that in its time, um, there was no default way of describing these things, right? When you're the first through the gate and sort of establishing the, the syntax and nomenclature um, for the first time, it's not always uh, immediately clear how certain concepts should be presented or represented. Um, so here we've got, you know, just a, a quick blurb that talks about virtually amplified token balances. It says that these are the formulas that are used to achieve it. And then underneath, it talks about what each one of these definitions, what each one of these objects actually means. Um, and some of these descriptions, again, are a little bit, uh, I think they're a little bit lacking in, in, in detail. If, if um, I was to, you know, give you just the text on this, um, on these two slides, I think you, you might be able to, um, to get to, um, you know, a, uh, a, a fairly good working understanding of what it actually is, but without the context of the rest of the pattern, I think it would be necessary. It would be probably impossible. So um, I'm going to start with um, what these concepts actually are, and then we're going to build back up to what is presented um, in those formulas that I just showed you. So this is the key, right? In Bancor V1, the, there's essentially a one at the, the front here in terms of the, um, the invariant function. Whereas in Bancor V2, um, rather than forcing this to be one, you can make this any number, any real number. Um, and that means that you are essentially virtualizing a different liquidity pool. So if you've got a certain number of tokens um, that's fulfilling um, the, the Bancor V1 uh, you know, bonding curve structure, when you move into the V2 prototype, this number A then moves the bonding curve to a different position. And this has some interesting effects. So first, let's go through what this, what this um, transformation is and, and what it means. Two of those, um, of those variables that were defined um, in the, the document that I just showed you were called the primary stake balance and the secondary stake balance. And what this means is it's the number of tokens that were um, that were available at the moment of the pool's creation, right? It's the literally the tokens that were staked um, when the uh, when the pool was made. And I'm just going to denominate these as x sub zero and y sub zero, just for this uh, for this demonstration. Now, um, remember if we're in the v1 context, 
we know precisely what the marginal uh, what the marginal exchange rate is between these two tokens here, right? Or if you'd like, just what the the first derivative of that um, of that bonding curve is. And you know, I, I do encourage you if you haven't already um, to derive this for yourself. Um, but it's essentially um, it, it's always going to be negative y zero over x zero in this particular case, um, multiplied by the um, the reciprocal of their reserve weights of the the ratio of their reserve weights and um so in this particular case let's just say that they that you know this is a 50 50 pool because um it, it doesn't matter too much but it's familiar enough that we can um that we can work with it um this means that you know there's a point on the um on the v1 curve and on the v2 curve that have that same derivative that have that same slope and so we're just going to mark those out okay so just again, just to recap, we've got the normal um, the normal bonding curve here, and we've we've created it with um, you know some some initial set of tokens. Imagine if you're setting up a Uniswap v2 pool, for example, you might provide um, you know two thousand USDC and one ETH to it, right? Then that would mean that if your ETH is zero X, then this would be one, and Y would be two thousand or something like that. Or maybe you're creating a stable coin pool, right? And you're you're only putting USDC and USDT in it. They're both coming in in equal proportions, maybe a million of each. Then Y0 and X0 are both 1 million. And that means that we can measure the, um, the, the first marginal exchange rate at the time that the pool is created, right? On that first block. And all I'm doing then is saying, okay, now that I've got that tangent line to this curve, then I need to draw a parallel line to that line that is also tangent to this next bonding curve, right? So you're looking for that kissing point, the, the thing that kind of translates between these, these two curves. Now, after that, um, what you'll find is that that point is the, whatever the X zero and Y zero uh, variables are multiplied by this coefficient A. Now, it's worth asking, um, if we are pretending, right, if we're virtualizing this second bonding curve, then it's only got the same number of tokens that the first bonding curve has, but it's now, um, you know, it's now using them at a faster rate. And so whatever that initial amount was, we can subtract it from, um, from where we've ended up on this virtual curve um, to find the point on this curve where we've run out of that token, right? So again, if we started with Y0 tokens, let's pretend this is USDT. We are amplifying that reserve amount by some coefficient A, but we're only virtualizing it at that stage, which means that even though it's only got Y0 tokens, it is behaving as though it has A times Y0 tokens. And Doesn't mean they've got more tokens. So by the time that's when it's actually run out, and the same is true um, in the other dimension. Um, oh, and uh, this means that if we, uh, it, by the time we're running out of whatever this Y zero token is, um, we're also going to be finding um, the maximum amount of whatever the the x axis can can afford. Okay, so same pattern over here. We're going to take whatever x zero is, and we're going to subtract that from the amplified balance to find this point where it runs out of that token. And then um, we can infer that if we are at this position on the curve, then we are at some maximum amount of, of Y tokens. And this is kind of almost everything you need to complete the geometric construction that I'm trying to show you. Um, before we complete it though, we need to uh, revisit these tangent lines at these different points. So you'll remember here, um, we started the point Y0, X0, and we drew a tangent line to the curve there. And then we made a parallel line um, and asked the question, where does it kiss this other hyperbola, this larger hyperbola? Um, and we said that that's at AX0, AY0, which is convenient. What we want to do now is we want to ask the question, um, first of all, what is the, um, what is the derivative of this this larger hyperbola at the point 
um, where we're running out of tokens. Because this is essentially going to tell you what the marginal rate is at the very edge of what your um, virtualized token balances are, are going to be able to, to service. So all I'm doing is tilting these, um, these parallel lines over and I'm uh, doing it to the point where we are now tangent to the, um, the hyperbola on V2. Um, and then I'm looking at where does it kiss the original V1 curve, okay? And then we do the same thing for the other um, set of coordinates. So here, this point, um, all the way up here, this is when we've completely run out of whatever the X token is in terms of real tokens. Um, and we're at our maximum um, balance of Y tokens. And down here, we're looking at um, whatever our, uh, at the, we're looking at the point where we've completely run out of Y tokens and we're at some maximum amount of, of X tokens. And then we're just taking the derivative of the curve at exactly those points um, and then drawing a parallel line back to the original curve, the unamplified curve, and marking those positions um, that it kisses as well. And what this results in um, is the construction of two squares. And um, the way to understand this A term, this A coefficient, is that it is the square root of the ratio of those two areas. That is the actual definition, the, the geometric intuition that I want you to have for what it means to have this A coefficient. Okay, so what does this mean? Like, what is the significance of this? Um, like, what does, why even have A? Why is this a helpful way of defining um, a concentrated liquidity curve? Um, this is the best intuition that I think I can give you, is that if we think about how many tokens can you trade um, between the, you know, between this point on the, um, on the regular bonding curve and the, and the final point, and you think about how many um, tokens you can trade um, across those same price points on the, um, on the uh, concentrated derivative, what you'll find is that the ratios of those two trades are exactly the same, right? Meaning that, you know, whatever I'm swapping on, on that tiny V1 box and whatever I'm getting out in, um, so my swap is in the X direction and I'm pulling out Y. So what it, the ratio of this amount to this amount is the same as the ratio of this amount to this amount, which means that effectively the execution price for these two trades is the same. However, their magnitudes are obviously very different. And this is the key, right? And maybe if you've been around the bonding curve space for a while, um, you would have heard you know, terms that I hate, things like capital efficiency, and maybe we, I'll go on a, a rant at some stage about why it's the wrong word to use. Um, but the, the point is, is that you are getting um, a better slippage profile for the liquidity that exists at the cost of no longer being able to offer liquidity at every single price point, right? You are now bounded between two prices where you can offer liquidity, um, and people that are interacting with that liquidity enjoy the benefit of better pricing. They effectively get cheaper prices trading with you. Um, but if their appetite in one direction overwhelms the liquidity that that pool has, it will simply stop trading um, because it's running out of tokens. Um, the best, um, you know, the, the best way that you can um, sort of if you wanted to explore um, you know, what the thinking was like back then when, when this concept was relatively new, um, the Medium article for the, um, for the, the Banco V2 releases is, is still up. Um, obviously, this is a deprecated system now for, for all kinds of reasons, and maybe that's something that we'll um, talk about in the next lecture. Um, but if you, if you move about halfway through the article, um, you'll see that um, one of the features, the one that we've just discussed, is that there is a change to the bonding curve in order to reduce the slippage. Um, and that was motivated by what was perceived at the time to be very harsh criticisms against AMMs because it requires a very large quantity of, of tokens in order to allow um, even moderate levels of, of trading volume. So this augmentation, this amplification or concentration of liquidity is um, was the answer to that. Um, and so just as an aside here, um, the, the term that we used, that Bancor used to describe the system was amplified liquidity. 
Um, and when Uniswap, um, you know, used the same idea two years later uh, or a year and a half later, they called it concentrated liquidity, which sound like they're kind of different things. Like when I think of something being amplified, I think about it getting larger um, and concentrated. I feel like something getting compressed. Um, but they are referring to exactly the same thing. These aren't um, you know, these aren't opposite effects. Okay, so let's return to um, these equations as, that, as they were presented in the V2 pattern. <clears throat> what we're really saying here is that the, um, the current balance times, you know, or the amplified version of the current balance, if you like the, the virtually amplified token balance where you are currently on whatever the bonding curve is, is equal to um, this amplification term times the original balance of tokens that you had at the time that the pool was created, if you want to think of it that way. I still think this is the best heuristic. Um, minus that same value, whatever that stake balance is, minus whatever the, um, the current balance is. So this would be like a variable that you store in the contract that would um, sort of orient, um, you know, it, it kind of marks the coordinates of whatever bonding curve you started with and say like, this is the, the place that we're, we're currently amplifying. Now, of course, this isn't the, um, the best way to, I think, present this equation. Um, you know, we can very easily just um, multiply out that negation um, and then, you know, gather like terms. We end up with something that I think is a little bit more presentable. Um, but these are um, exactly the, have exactly the same meaning um, as, uh, you know, what these, uh, these code excerpts were, were trying to present. And then, of course, once we're there, um, all it's saying is that everything else from here on out is the same so long as we don't run out of tokens, right? So this is that same, um, you know, V1 um, bonding curve invariant that you're, that you're already very familiar with. It's just that now, instead of using um, the X balance directly, it's now X tilde, where tilde is you know, telling you that this is a, a, virtualized, um, a virtualized system. The bonding curve is much larger than it should be, meaning that it can run out of tokens at any time. <clears throat> okay, so we don't have to stop there. This is a very inconvenient way, um, I think, of, uh, of handling um, this type of system. Um, this, you know, for the record, though, um, I think um, Kyberswap's DMM, it actually uses that implementation exactly as written in this pattern. Um, they are um, they still maintain balances both of real tokens and of virtual tokens um, and include variables in the smart contracts as to what the price will be when it's running out of tokens and that kind of thing. Um, but I think a slightly more elegant um, approach is to um, rather than have the, you know, some pretend virtual token balance up somewhere else on this curve is instead force the, um, the, the place where you're running out of tokens um, to be commensurate with the Cartesian plane that you're actually using, right? So rather than say, oh, I'm running out of tokens up here at some virtual balance, you would rather just use the real token balance itself and that means that you're just then, um, you know, you need to get out of this equation. You can no longer um, treat it this way. Um, and you just need to basically apply some sort of correction factor that moves you, um, you know, from this, this amplified case down so that the point X0, Y0 is um, commensurate with um, both of the, both the amplified and the unamplified bonding curves. Now, the, there are more than, one way um, that you can approach this problem. Um, and I have a, uh, a demonstration. Um, this is gonna be very, very short, um, but there is a, just for acknowledgement's sake, um, there is a, a, a person somewhere in the world named Kevin. I don't know um, any more than that, um, but he's got a, um, a YouTube channel, a GitHub, this is his Twitter. And uh, he's created uh, a whole bunch of really interesting, um, you know, uh, really interesting material. He's got a game out on um, on Steam, I think, where it's like a, you know, it's a, just a, a free exploration world sort of thing. But instead of living in Euclidean space, you can start, you know, you can move into spherical space or you can move into um, like hyperbolic space and, and sort of get a, an idea for what those things might look like. And I suspect that um, this program that he created that I found in, in his GitHub was created specifically to deal with um, 
with some of the the, the problems that you might encounter when you're creating a, a, a mixed perspective game like that. Um, so you can just confirm for me that you see like a blue a blue grid with um, five red points and a white circle. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Um, so what this what this is is a, a visual proof that any five points uniquely define a conic. Um, so you can see I can move um, some of these points around and it will start to draw like an ellipse and it really like a circle, it turns out is just a very you know special kind of ellipse. Um, but then as I move some of these out, it will become a, um, a hyperbola um, and you know then back into an ellipse. And so you know it, this is I, I find just a very visceral way of um, sort of coming to terms with what some of these things are. Um, but the more you play with this, you realize that a parabola is just like a very special case of a um, of an ellipse where the you know the um, the opposite vertex is at the point at infinity. Um, and then you know when you um, when you start to pull these apart, you realize that a um, a hyperbola is also just a special kind of ellipse, but where the um, the opposite vertex is kind of past infinity. Um, and so the, the point that I'm raising here is that if you know something about these five points, right? If you want to create um, a, a specific type of, um, of, um, of hyperbola, you only need five reference points and you can then move this anywhere in the Cartesian plane um, and uh, generate your hyperbolic um, bonding curve that way. Um, the interesting thing is, is that all of these, um, all of these uh, five points um, can also be replaced by tangent lines. So you don't even need um, just five points on the curve. You can actually just define five linear equations um, and they, those will also uniquely define um, a specific hyperbola. And so this is, I think, key, right? This is uh, just the, the, uh, such, a helpful, um, such a helpful thing when you're trying to you know, do stuff in the bonding curve space to know that you know, essentially everything that you want to do can be expressed as, um, as a conic section. And that if you know five points or five lines or any, um, any combination thereof, that you can easily define a, um, you know, a specific equation anywhere on um, the Cartesian um, axis um, that has the properties that you want. So for example, one of these, um, one of these tangent lines could be the um the the price at which you are running out of one of these tokens another one of these tangent lines could be the you know um the asymptote right um of, of uh, oh actually it can't be the asymptote but you understand what i mean if you've got certain uh, if you know certain things right coordinates where you know the bonding curve must pass through or um tangent lines you know prices effectively that you know that it must adhere to then you can easily create um, a uh, a formula for your conic section, and then just um, and then just create that. Okay. Um, just as a quick aside, I also want to recommend um, this video by um, Tehran Knudsen. Um, which has a look at the projective plane, um, which is again probably the best way to understand um, that uh, those conic sections that I was talking about before. And really, like you know, I, I, I wish I could say that I just watched these two videos and then came up with the equations that I'm about to show you, but that's not true. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of came to these videos in the process of of trying to understand um, some of the things that I had created via other geometric and algebraic constructions. But I wish that I had started with an understanding of, of, of um, geometric, um, of the of this geometric projection, because um, I think that would have been just a, a much more efficient um, way of doing stuff. Okay, so moving on. Um, just quickly, um, we're gonna treat the, the, res the reserve invariant the same with respect to how the reserve weights work. Okay, so just remember that this sentence in you know formal logic just means that for every um, reserve weight that we have in the set of reserve weights that define our bonding curve, they are all a number between zero and one, and the sum of all of the reserve weights is equal to one. That is not changed. Everything else is going to change. This is now our um, our invariant function. So let's just quickly have a look through this. 
um, the part on the right, I think is relatively self-explanatory, right? This is literally that the, uh, it just says that the product of all of these, remember these are these reference points, essentially the, the, um, the balance of that token when you set up the bonding curve in the first place, or like when you created the liquidity pool in the first place. Um, but that, again, that is just a, um, a way of thinking about it, a way to, to intuit through what that coordinate means. It doesn't have to start there, right? This could just be an arbitrary coordinate and you can actually start your liquidity pool with some other um, balance of tokens from the outset um, and move back to uh, a situation um, where the, you know, where the, the real token balances are equal to some imagined um, starting state of the pool. So the, the point that I'm making here is that this is basically this X zero parameter. It is just another constant, right? It, it's, um, it, it's just a parameter that describes your bonding curve. It is essentially um, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the coordinates of these points, right? That lie somewhere on your bonding curve. So when we've got all of these, um, when we've got all of these together, um, let's say in n dimensions, um, they are all referring to one explicit point um, on the manifold that you know your hyperbola must pass through. Um, and so we take the product of those, and that effectively becomes our c constant or our k constant. The um, the other terms um, I don't think are too difficult to understand. Um, x p k means what it did before, right? This is just the, the real token balance of our liquidity system. Um, the difference is that it used to be the case where this number cannot be zero, right? It had to be a number greater than zero. But now we're in a concentrated liquidity case. And so now zero is allowed um, for these token balances. And that's going to mean that some of the equations that we introduce in order to describe these systems become necessarily complicated as we have to handle um, you know, as we now have to handle zeros in the algebra. Um, this x zero is the same one that's over here. So this is a, uh, this constant is used on both sides of the equality. Um, and then um, a is again, that amplification term, which I showed you is if you draw uh, boxes around the unamplified curve and the amplified curve at the prices where the amplified curve is running out of liquidity and compare the ratio of their square roots, you get this number a. The, um, the problem I have with this particular expression and the choice of, um, of the choice of A is that I would much rather um, have a system that I can denominate between some maximum amplification and some minimum amount of amplification. Um, and the problem with that is that if I wanted to get to maximum amplification with A, um, I would need to literally take the limit all the time as A tends to infinity. But there's a, um, a, a much faster way that we can sort of shortcut around that. And that's to define a different parameter, gamma. And gamma is just the inverse of A. And then we can just substitute one over A for gamma through all of these equations. And now we've got something that is, I think, a little bit more compact. Um, we have to, you know, we don't have to deal with infinity as much. We still have to deal with zero, but I can, um, you can see. Um, sorry, hello. Sorry, I couldn't tell if someone was trying to say something. Um, the, um, you know, you can see that um, gamma equaling zero here is just not a problem, right? Because it just means that it cancels out this term. Um, and then we just end up with um, X zero is equal, to, you know, the product of all of these X zero coordinates is equal to the product of all of these X zero coordinates. Not too difficult. Okay, so um, now that we actually have an expression that we can use and or, 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 an effective reserve invariant using real token balances, um, so there are no virtual token balances in this expression. Let's now think about what each one of these parameters actually does. So when we're dealing with gamma, what I want you to imagine is that you're sticking a pin in the, um, the kissing point between the unamplified curve and the amplified one. When we change the gamma parameter, what we're doing is effectively um, symmetric stretching of the two axes. And I'm going to show you this on, um, on Desmos in a minute. But just, just remember what I've said, right? When you're, when you're playing around with gamma, the, this particular point, in fact, this is the only point um, on the entire plot that will remain exactly the same on the amplified curve. And the, um, the relative scale of the x and y axis is going to move. 
Okay, what about the reserve weights? For the reserve weights, just remember that they must sum to one. And so in the case where we've only got two dimensions, um, you know, either one of these is going to be, you know, one minus the other. We still, um, we still keep the this point in the middle um, perfectly stationary. And now we can asymmetrically stretch um, these axes. So when we're compressing one axis, we're stretching the other and, and vice versa. Okay, what about when we're playing around with um, the X zero coordinate? If we're moving X zero or if we're changing the value of X zero, what we do is we basically put a pin in the Y intercept um, for this curve. And then that allows us to just um, stretch or compress the X axis. And then the, the um, opposite is going to be true of Y zero. Um, if we are playing around with this parameter, we're effectively putting a pin in the X intercept and then adjustably um, stretching or uh, manipulating the Y axis. And in a way that makes that makes sense. So at the um, you know at the end of um, of this demonstration, all I want you to remember is that y zero allows you to just stretch the y axis or compress the y axis. Um, if you're dealing with x zero, you are just um, stretching or compressing the x axis. Gamma, um, you are stretching and compressing both axes together symmetrically. And when you're playing with the reserve weights, you're compressing and stretching them asymmetrically. And so, as I said, uh, I think that this is going to be slightly um, more, slightly easier to appreciate if we move to Desmos. Sean, can you can confirm for me that you can see um, a Desmos graphing calculator screen? Yeah, got it. Perfect. Okay, so let's see, um, let's see if we can re repeat some of those properties that I just said. Um, so just confirm for yourself, right, that these are the, um, the expressions that I had up before. Um, the thing you'll note here is that I'm using x0, y0 um, for, the, for the constant here. This isn't, um, this isn't absolutely necessary, but it helps me to, um, to demonstrate for you um, that the, these curves are referring to the same sized curve. It's just that one of them is, um, uh, is augmented compared to the other. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, what happens when we move our x, okay? So you can see here, I've already set our y to be 1 minus this value so that these things will um, add up to 1. And you'll see that there is this kind of pivot point, right, right here, where if I move in one direction, um, you know, the, uh, the curves is kind of rolling around as if it's literally been pinned in place at that exact spot. Um, but it's changing the um, both the the y intercept and the x intercept as I move it around. So that's the um, the reserve weights um, sort of acting on um, acting on this invariant function. Um, let's see if I, I'll, I'm going to put that at two twenty. Um, so now watch what happens when I move gamma around. See how it's no longer rolling around, but it's like it's becoming more and more like the curve that we started with or more and more like a straight line. Um, and in fact, when gamma is equal to zero, um, it is in fact a perfectly straight line and you would get what's called a constant sum um, bonding curve. And that's the limit um, of this invariant function as gamma approaches zero. And as gamma approaches one, it's actually equal to just the, the same bonding curve that we started with. This is no amplification at all which brings some interesting questions into view, which is what happens when we go past one. Now we're getting not amplified liquidity, but contracted liquidity. This is now a liquidity pool that is behaving as though it's got less liquidity in it than it really does. So rather than using virtual token balances that are larger than the amount of tokens we have, we're now using virtual token balances that are smaller than the amount of tokens that we have. Um, and um, another interesting question is, what happens when we let G be a negative number, right? What, what does it mean to have a negatively amplified liquidity pool? Um, and this actually gives you something that we haven't seen um, before, which is a bonding curve that goes the opposite way. Now, this isn't, you might think at first that this is a ridiculous thing to have, right? Why would you want a bonding curve that, that has this feature? 
that actually this is a timeless Dutch auction, right? So this would give you um, essentially the, the more of the thing that you buy, the cheaper it gets. This is actually how most of the commodities in the world are sold, right? If you come to my supermarket and buy, you know, a kilogram of potatoes, I might sell it to you for 50 cents a potato. But if you come to my factory and buy a ton of potatoes, I'll give it to you for one cent a potato. The more of the thing that you buy, the cheaper it is. And this is a bonding curve that expresses exactly that. Um, not, I wouldn't call that a financial paradigm. I'd actually call that an economic paradigm, right? You are trying to incentivize someone to take more of your inventory. Um, and so having a negative amplification actually gives you that. The more of the thing that you buy, the cheaper it gets, right? The, the exchange rate becomes more beneficial for the trader as they're taking inventory out of the system. Think of it like flash sales or, or something like that. Um, and like, like I said, you can think of it as a time independent um, Dutch auction. And it's worth pointing out that once we're here, we can still play around with you know, Rx, right? So we can um, tailor the, um, the, how aggressive this curve actually is. Right, so you can see here it's got a relatively consistent, um, you know, relatively consistent rate. But then, you know, towards the end, it sells everything off relatively quickly and things like that. Um, so this is um, this is how um, how the the reserve weights and 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 gamma um, sort of affect um, this type of bonding curve. Now we can play around with um, x zero and y zero. And I think in order to do this, I'm going to bring gamma back to 0.5, and I'll bring uh, reserve weights back to half half so that we can see things a little bit easier. So you can see here that the y-intercept um, of our augmented curve is now at 300 and the x-intercept is also at 300. But watch what happens when I start to play with x0 here. I can now move um, the, the x-intercept but leave the y-intercept exactly where it is, right? So um, if I take this back, you know, to, uh, you know, to about one third of Y zero, you can now see that the, the bonding curve begins um, at a token balance of, um, of Y equals 300, X equals zero, and continues throughout this profile to a token balance of X equals 100, Y equals zero. And I can play around with both of these, right? So um, if I'm playing around with X zero, I'm leaving the Y intercept in place and I'm moving the X intercept as I want. And if I am playing with Y zero, I'm leaving the X intercept in place and I'm moving the Y intercept to wherever I want. And so you can see that with some combination of all of these things, right? You've got a, a, like what is effectively a very, very, um, a very powerful equation because you know, all of these things will give you sort of like different bonding curves with, with different properties, including you know, this, like, this Dutch auction style thing and, and whatever, you know, whatever else. Um, and you know, I'll make sure that um, that I I share this um, this um, this calculator with you guys. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give the um, the the link to to Rabbit, and he can distribute it or or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure that the that this is is as clear as as possible um, because it is I think um, it, this is really the fundamental theory of um, what it is to be a concentrated liquidity curve. Okay. Uh, Mark, can I ask a quick question? Of course. Um, I, I think it's a, a kind of silly question, but it's just um, how did you get the two uh, curves touching at that point? Um, if we consider the original amplification, uh, we have a sort of the second curve is, is shifted up and to the right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what changed? to get that second yeah. third amplified, but also tangent. Yeah, so, and this is, um, this is kind of what I meant when, um, you know, the, 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 the best thing to say, so yeah, let's, re let's revisit those two slides. So what we have um, when we're looking at, at this amplified curve is just a virtual token balance. But we know that this number up here, right, is so is this you know amplification coefficient multiplied by um, you know whatever the uh, remaining uh, whatever the remaining tokens is? In fact, if I uh, 
come back to, let's go back a little bit farther. So let's let's have a look at what this is is actually telling us. The, the equation says the primary column balance amplified is equal to the primary stake balance amplified. And remember I said that this primary stake balance, this is just a coordinate. Um, this is the X zero or Y zero, whatever it is, times that same amplification coefficient. But then we're still getting the primary stake balance and the primary column balance in here. And the thing that you that, that I'm trying to, um, to show you here is that we don't actually care what the primary current balance amplified is, the things that we care about are all in here, right? So um, this x tilde um, is kind of um, is kind of ir irrelevant. Um, all we need to know is how x tilde interfaces with everything else. So if you take this um, this invariant function here and just replace it with these terms. Right? So instead of using x tilde, use x0 a minus 1 plus x to the power of rx. Right? And instead of using y tilde, use y0 a minus 1 plus y to the power of ry. And instead of using c, we're going to use x0 times y0. Right? This is the thing that gives us that, um, that same point that you're talking about. And the reason is simple. If you imagine that the amplification coefficient is 1, Right? meaning there is no amplification. This, the virtual tokens is the same as the other tokens. Then it should be clear that whatever these two um, components are is equal to the, the normal constant of, um, you know, of the constant product um, Douglas Cobb function um, that we've seen today, right? that we've seen in the last two lectures. So you, you start with some very basic, um, you can start with these very basic assumptions and construct the formula that way. Or you can start from the projective plane and develop the, the equations that way. They both arrive at exactly the same solution. Um, it's just that in one of them, we kind of, it, you're basically just arriving at the same conclusion from, from two different perspectives. You are either deliberately creating a hyperbola with certain properties, like an asymptote at certain sections, um, you know, X and Y intercepts at certain sections. Um, and then you're just drawing that and you can, after a lot of algebraic manipulation, arrive at an answer. Or you can say, um, I'm creating an amplified curve, but I don't care about my virtual token balances. I only care about my real balances. And both of those solutions converge at, you know, a, a set of equations, including the two that I've shown you today. Is that, does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay. So um, I have a, um, I have now an animation that I prepared using um, Manim that I would like to show you. Um, I hope this plays smoothly. Uh, if it's too jerky, let me know and we can, um, we can move on. Um, but this is uh, this is a software package for Python um, and Cairo that was created by uh, Grant Sanderson of uh, a YouTube channel called Three Blue One Brown. Um, and what I'm what I'm doing here is uh, this is one of the other equations, um, by the way, um, that you can use to describe this amplification. Um, but the reason I've made this is because we can now start exploring it in logarithmic space. Um, under certain constraints, whereas on Desmos you can't do that, um, or at least not not very easily. So let's have a look at what we're what we're doing here. Um, what I'm showing is that when gamma is equal to zero, you are a straight line, right? The amplification is is infinite, right? It, it's it's uh, um, it, it has no slippage anywhere on its curve. Um, and when we're at gamma equals one, we're equal to the same curve, which means that any value for gamma between zero and one is representing some arbitrary amplification level. And as we move x zero and y zero around, uh, where y zero here is just k divided by x zero, um, what we're doing is we're changing the point at which these two, where the amplified and the unamplified curves kiss, right? Um, and so if we move k up and down, you can see that we get the same, um, the same effect that we would expect from a traditional um, from a traditional bonding curve. 
So again, um, as we move uh, gamma now to values higher than one, we get um, contracted bonding curves. But everything else that I've set up until now still remains true. You can see here, as I move X zero around, all I'm doing is changing the point um, at which the, um, the amplified, or in this case, contracted curve um, is touching the, the other curve. And then when we move to negative gamma values, we're effectively taking the, uh, the, the mirrored version of this thing. Um, but again, um, I, for the, the value of repetition, as I move that X zero coordinate up and down, you can see that the, the flipped curve is just sliding around um, on, the, um, on the original curve at exactly one point. Um, and that one point, by the way, will have exactly the same gradient in both the amplified un and the unamplified one. So there's lots of, um, there's lots of really interesting um, geometric and algebraic um, stuff that we can do here. Uh, can you guys still see my screen, by the way? Yeah, back to Desmos. Back to Desmos? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, my, uh, that animation uh, killed my computer for some reason. Okay. So um, let's move on with other graphical representations because so far, everything that we've done has been in two dimensions. Um, but as I said, you know, we spent the last two lectures building up to this case where everything that you do in two dimensions can be done in any number of dimensions. It's just a, you know, it's just a manifold system. Um, and so what, what looks like a curve in two dimensions becomes a surface in, in three dimensions and then a hypersurface in, in four dimensions or a volume in, in four dimensions and so on. Um, this again is a cross-eyed stereogram. You remember I presented one of these last week. Um, and so if you go cross-eyed and let your sort of left eye focus on the right image and your right eye focus on the left image, you should get the illusion um, of, of, of depth here. Um, I've noticed that you know some people can't do this. It's also um, contingent on um, the the size of your screen and sort of your distance from it and that sort of thing to make the, the illusion um, effective. And so we also use um, you know these kinds of interactive um, interactive plots and other things um, in order to achieve um, you know in order to to get our bearings in, in how these systems actually work. Um, and so what I will do now is um, we will go to Jupiter. Uh, confirm for me that you can see this. Okay. Um, so what I have here is um, a class that handles um, all of the, the generalized amplification. Um, so all of the things that we've spoken about today and, and, and more. And so just, just go through this. Um, the you know x underscore um, is a, a dictionary where each one of the um, the keys is effectively the thing that you would put at that um, after that underscore to denominate the type of token that it is. So if we wanted to you know instead of a and b and things, these could be like ETH and you know BTC or or, or whatever. And I'm just um, starting them out with a a certain number of um, of tokens to get started. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, um, I'm using the, the decimal object here, which means that we can um, perform calculations with arbitrary precision. So there's a, a command that you can tell um, Python to say, you know, I want to use 1,000 decimal places of precision, please, or 1 million decimal places of precision. Um, and the, the decimal package is just extremely helpful for that. It's not the only one that allows for it, but it's the one that I'm the most accustomed to. Um, the, um, the R's are obviously the, the reserve weights. X zero, right? A, B, C, D, and so on. These are, of course, the, the coordinates, right? The, the point on the curve that we are trying to amplify. And um, I, I still think that that is the best way to, um, to understand it. And then P underscore is the, um, the oracle prices, right? That we want to give to this thing. Um, and then gamma is gamma, right? This is our amplification coefficient or the inverse of our amplification coefficient. So if uh, a gamma, if we're feeding this a gamma value of one half, then that means that we're getting an amplification of 2x. Um, and then we just create the, um, create the class like this. Um, and it's going to show us what these reserve balances are and, and everything else. So there are two things that I want to draw your attention to here immediately, which is this intercept column and this asymptote column. 
So watch what happens when I set gamma to one. We get the intercept at infinity and the asymptote at zero. Now that should sound very familiar, right? When we're dealing with constant product curves, we kind of define them as being curves that have an intercept at infinity, meaning you can never run out of that token and an asymptote at zero, meaning the, it's impossible to drive any token balance to zero. But when we change this, this, gamma, this gamma value to any number, let's say to 0 0.5, we're actually moving the intercept and the asymptote around. And this is again, coming back to that projective, um, you know, projective geometry definition um, that I was, that I was uh, trying to, to get you to entertain um, when it comes to conic sections. These are now variables that we can use if we wanted to, to define our, um, our, our hyperbola. And they are redundant with this X zero term. So if you, if you were so inclined and you thought, you know, this, this, this uh, staked balance or you know, origin balance or X zero parameter is something that you find unhelpful or is, um, is unappealing for any reason, is irrelevant for your implementation or the product that you're trying to build. What I'm showing you here is that you actually have the freedom to choose from a large number of other variable types um, that will define exactly the same hyperbola, but under different, like from a different perspective. Like they, there are a very large number of redundant ways that you can write an equation for exactly the same conic, which is, I think, um, both a, a surprising and beautiful um, realization to come to. Because when you are, you know, trying to create these systems, especially in a smart contract sense you will have limitations such as storage space, such as, you know, um, you know precision in a fixed point, um, in a fixed point infrastructure and, and other things that are going to, to influence how you decide on which equation is worth implementing. And so to know that you have this enormous over parameterization space to explore, to arrive at the exact um, implementation that is the most gas efficient, that is the most you know, numerically stable, um, that is the fastest to compute, these kinds of things are things that as, you know, as a bonding curve research group, you should be aware of. Because just because you can create a function that has the properties that you want, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to implement that function on a blockchain. Um, there are, you know, constraints. You, you need to, you know, you, we're, we're engineers in a way. You need to, to work under the, um, you know, the, the limitations that the system that you're building for provides you with. You can't sort of um, impose your demands on the system. Um, you, have to, you have to work with what you're given. Um, and so these intercepts and asymptotes are, uh, you know, it's just a, another part of that parameter space. And I've got a homework question about these things coming up. So just know that when we get there that I've um, given it the appropriate amount of, of foreshadowing. Um, the Oracle price means the same thing um, as it did in the last lecture. Um, and I can show you what happens when we rebalance this pool is that it actually tells me um, what swaps um, to perform um, in order to get the, the pool into that state. Now, what's interesting about this one is that you all saw what, what um, you know, at the beginning of, um, of this lecture, the answer to the homework question from the last lecture, which was, here's a formula and we can find the coordinates at some, you know, at some point. Um, and then, you know, even though I didn't show you how to generate this method, I'm sure many of you thought, and I, I know that at least Rabbit and, um, and Octopus were thinking that they have uh, a way to approach, like an algorithmic way to approach that problem that they think that they could, um, that they, that they could um, arrive at relatively simply. And maybe that's true. Um, but now think, what would that look like in, um, in, um, in an amplified scenario, right? If you're using a concentrated liquidity version of an n-dimensional bonding curve, then you're going to need to start thinking about what it means to run into zeros or negative token balances, because we can't allow the bonding curve to ever approach a negative token balance. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that as it's running off of the curve, that it won't have an impact on how the price is quoted for the other assets. Something to consider. So for example, um, if I change the, the Oracle prices here um, and rebalance the pool that way, you can see that now um, one of these token balances has actually run to zero. 
um, and this is um, you know this has changed the, um, the the way that these reserve weights are going to work in the other instances, and also means that um, the um, you know that we now lose the ability to correctly quote the um, you know the exchange rate of A versus these other tokens. Right, we can do it in one direction. We we can still say if you want to trade you know, B for A, um, it's going to cost you one point. Oh, sorry, if you want to trade A for B, um, you know, it will cost you this number of, of A tokens per, per B token, right? If you want to buy one of these B tokens, um, the, the amount of A that you need to provide is 0 0.74. Um, but unfortunately, um, you can't trade the other direction because it doesn't have any A tokens left to give which is um, you know, something that you need to consider um, because it means that the, these Oracle prices will no longer refer to a specific point in three dimensions, but more um, they will only refer to a specific point in or in, in any number of dimensions if that point exists. If something has moved out of range, right? And this is the, the, um, the, the language that you will hear people discuss when they're talking about things like Uniswap V3, right? If the, the price is out of range, you end up all in, in one token um, in a two-dimensional system. But what does that look like in three dimensions, in four dimensions, in five dimensions? Something to consider. Um, and again, just for um, just for the, um, the sake of, um, of clarity here, um, this is the, a similar plot to the one that I presented, I think, last week. Um, but instead of, and let's, let's just revisit the one that, uh, that I presented last week. Comment. Come back to that one. All right, we'll look at that one in a minute. But the, um, you know, the, we had this shape or I presented this shape that looked like, ah, here it is, right? You guys remember this? We've got sort of the familiar bonding curve shape at the top, on the left and on the right. Think about, um, you know, if this is a three-dimensional slice, that means I'm gonna take a, um, you know, the amplified curve that we're looking at is going to be um, a box, right? Drawn around some coordinate inside this thing. Right. And so what you need to be asking yourself is, you know, what would this surface look like if, um, you know, if I took, um, if I, if I took like a three dimensional, if I took a cube and sort of moved it through the manifold, right? How would the, the part of this bonding curve that's inside of that cube, what would it look like? And it might, you know, it might not take you very long to convince yourself that this is the shape that it would have, right? This is literally that that cuboid um, slice of the, um, the unamplified curve, okay? And um, we should also um, start thinking, you know, what, um, what else can we, can we do with this? Because um, this is still looking at, I think, a case where we've got um, an amplification of, let's restart this, of 0 0.5. Well, what would it look like if we increased that amount of, of amplification? What if we went to like 0 0.2, um, 0 0.2 to the start? Oops. See, now we get sort of a, what looks to be a much flatter, a much wider surface area. And um, in a way that should be um, that should be intuitive, because when we're going to larger amplifications, we're effectively you know drawing a smaller and smaller cube that we're using to pass through that manifold. And so uh, you know you can still see that we get that curvature, right? If we zoom up on this, um, if we zoom up on this a little bit more, you can still see that we have this gentle curve in each one of these axes, right? Um, from the top, you can see there is that part of the bonding curve. And on this dimension, there's that part of the bonding curve. But what do you think it would look like if we increased the, um, 
if we increase the amplification to infinity. Just quietly think to yourself, like what would that actually be? Let's just run all the cells again. Right, we now just get a triangle, right? A perfectly straight triangle. Um, and this in a way should make sense because this is something that is slipping, like where the price is slipping no, um, at, at a rate of zero. So no matter where we move on this surface, the, the gradient in every dimension is, is still the same. And we don't even, you know, we're, we're not just limited to, um, to A, B, and C. We can, you know, move through these dimensions the same way that we have before. Um, the, the point is, is that the exchange rate will always be the same, no matter where we are. And so this would be appropriate for something like a stable coin um, pool, where you can have like USDC, USDT, DAI in there, um, and just set the amplification to, to infinity. And this will always give you a one-to-one, -one, if, you, if you so desire it, a one-to-one -one rate of exchange, um, regardless of whatever the, the balances currently are. Okay, so coming up on 80 minutes, um, which is good. So I've timed this um, timed as well. Okay, so um, the, um, the real take home message that I, I think I want you to take away from, uh, from this presentation is that um, with the, the V2 invention, what we really were trying to do was to offer, um, offer a system that for the same liquidity amount, offered better transaction rates for people that are interacting with that liquidity. Um, and so the, um, the, the way that it was, you know, uh, it was conventionally explained was to just imagine um, a, a larger liquidity curve than was actually there by multiplying um, essentially all of, the, all of the reserve balances by a certain number in order to achieve a, um, a <clears throat> liquidity, uh, like a, a, a new amount of virtual liquidity. And after that, everything is the same that you've seen before, right? Apart from this equation, which is new, this, um, you know, this reserve invariant um, and this sum of the reserve weights and this coordinate of I given J, et cetera, these are all like directly out of V1, right? And this is why I've copied it across. So you can actually compare these, right? Apart from the tilde, um, this equation is the same. This equation is literally the same. And again, um, this equation is the same apart from the tildes. But if you want to use the true reserve invariant, meaning what is the actual, if you want to track, um, you know, the actual token balances inside the pool, not on some imaginary amplified pool, then you need to actually move the the hyperbola around and um, and um, define where its intercepts are on the the y and the x axis. And if you're in um, a large number of dimensions, then you need to define where its intercepts are on every single one of those dimensions. Um, and when you're changing those intercepts, be aware that you're also changing their asymptotes. And these two things um, will have, uh, you know, are, are linked together in some very profound way. Um, and it's a, a little out of the scope of these presentations, but if you find yourself um, exploring some of these ideas, um, and you, and you feel like reaching out to me so that we can um, go over them together, I'd be very happy to entertain that. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that I think is best done, um, you know, it's it, it's best discovered on your own, right? To ask the question, what is the relationship between the intercept of a augmented or an amplified hyperbola and its asymptote? Um, or, you know, what is the relationship between the ratio of those two things and the amplification coefficient that I'm using? All of these things have a very strict um, algebraic set of like effective laws um, that define the conic and so that you know that can't be um, that, that can't be violated without um, effectively drawing some other shape. Now um, this is where things get tricky because that um, that coordinate of i given j function um, has a, um, a gamma term in a denominator and I've already shown you that we are more than capable of using um, gamma is equal to zero, um, which means that for a lot of these expressions, um, you're going to have to get very familiar with taking the, the limit. Um, and some of those limits are very untrivial. 
So in this particular case, it's not too bad. Um, so the um, the limit of this expression um, as gamma approaches zero is this, um, which you know I know that these things look um, dramatically different, um, but I think that you should be able to um, to prove to yourself um, that you know because gamma is equal to um, because gamma is equal to zero, a lot of these things kind of cancel out in some um, in in some helpful way. There's a, a very large number of methods that you can use to find uh, to find these limits. I'm also going to give you um, these token swap equations just to, to save you a bit of time. Um, and I think um, it is kind of um, that there is some level of appeal in the way that these are presented because they do look, um, you know, it, it's obvious that they come from like the same family of geometry as the original swap equations that you've seen, right? So um, you can see here, that there's some term out the front that is referring to the token balance of the thing that you're trying to swap. And then you can see that in, you know, inside the parentheses, you still have one minus some term, which is like the ratio or some expression of the ratio of those token balances and their amplification levels. Um, so the, the, the overall um, skeleton, I think, of the swap equation remains the same in this one, whereas in a, a lot of the other um, algebraic uh, representations of this same theory, um, the swap equations can look um, you know, it can look extremely um, alien uh, with respect to each other. So I think that this is the, the best place to start because at least you can get some uh, like visceral understanding for what the similarities are between these two systems. Um, but then later on um, in, um, in the, the fourth lecture, I will show you much more exotic uh, representations of these things that are much, much smaller, much more computationally efficient. Um, but again, uh, we've got gamma here in the um, in the denominator, meaning that we need to um, we need to take the the limit if we're using gamma is equal to zero. And look what happens. This is um, telling you that uh, this is actually a variation of the constant sum or the constant price um, uh, swap equation because x zero j and x zero i are just constants, and so is r j and r i. So this whole thing over here is just constant. And so what this is telling you is that the, the swap of xj for xi is just whatever, um, you know, uh, whatever your input is multiplied by some constant. Um, and then if you flip this upside down, you get the, the result in the other direction. Um, and so this is, again, just a, a, a nice, you know, it, it shouldn't be surprising because we just saw um, graphically that when you take gamma to zero, you end up with a perfectly straight line, which is the, um, you know, the invariant um representation of a constant price formula but now we're getting it from a different perspective as well and it's just nice to get that confirmation um similarly the the marginal price formula um again very very similar construction to what you've seen in the unamplified in the unamplified case which i think is um again in, in terms of your visceral understanding is going to um, support a much deeper understanding of, of these equations before we get into the more exotic archetypes um and then if you take the limit of this uh, uh, if you take the limit of um, of this, both as you know the the swap amount is approaching zero, um, and as gamma is um, is going to zero, so inf infinite inf amplification. Again, you can see it approaches some constant, um, meaning that um, that uh, as the amplification reaches infinity, uh, we are approaching the um, uh, a situation where the, the the marginal rate of exchange is constant no matter where you are, uh, which is again uh, another way of defining um, a um, the you know the the constant sum or the constant price um, you know bonding curve like like M stable used for example. So now we're coming up to this is the the, the end of um, of the lecture, um, and I want to issue um, a little bit more homework this time than on the last two, because I think there's a lot to, to digest here. Um, the, the first, and, you know, these kind of go in this ascending order of difficulty, uh, where the last one is, is especially challenging. Um, so the first one is just to show that for any finite amplification factor, that the asymptote for, um, for any dimension is equal to whatever this, um, this X zero coordinate is for that same token. Um, multiplied by gamma minus one over gamma. And you will note here that as long as gamma is a number between zero and one, excuse me, as long as gamma is a number between zero and one, this means that the asymptote is always going to be negative, which makes sense 
because um, when we're amplifying these curves, we're really pulling the asymptotes away from zero back into the negative domain. Um, and when um, when gamma is a, uh, a, a number greater than one, the asymptote is going to be uh, a number greater than zero. Um, and again, that makes sense because you saw that we're also able to contract the curve, uh, which effectively moves the, um, the asymptotes back up off of the origin and, you know, um, and, and into the, um, the positive domain. Um, so I want you to show that this is true. And then um, of course, after you've done that, um, show that for an, uh, for an infinite amplification factor, that the asymptote doesn't exist, right? Essentially, it becomes negative infinity. Now, the, the reason I've said that um, it, this is negative infinity rather than, um, you know, rather than doesn't exist um, is because uh, I'm referring back to this geometric projection where, um, you know, the, the, the points of it, and this could be plus minus infinity, I suppose. Um, but the idea is that it's actually there. It's th that straight line is still a type of conic. It's just a, um, you know, it's just a very special one. <clears throat> okay. The um, the next set um, is to then deal with the intercepts. So show that for um, for any finite amplification factor, meaning gamma is not equal to zero and um, the A is not equal to infinity, show that the maximum possible true balance of any token is this X intercept. And this, well, like I said, we're going slightly more challenging, um, but this is basically showing you, um, you know, imagine that the, imagine you've got an amplified pool, let's say with five different assets in it, and one of those assets goes to zero, right? goes to a price of zero, so that the market effectively dumps all of that token, and it goes down in value 99.9999%, right? Something like Iron Finance or, you know, UST or something like that. That means that um, you know the the market when it's equilibrating your pool is going to be dumping all of those tokens into it and removing all of the other tokens, meaning that eventually your liquidity pool will be composed of nothing but that one token. That'll be the only token left. And the question is, for any arbitrary liquidity pool, how many of those tokens will you have if its price goes to zero? Um, and um, similarly, um, for an infinite amplification, so when gamma is equal to zero, when a is equal to infinity. Um, show that the, um, the 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 limit of this expression is actually just the um, the the x zero constant divided by the reserve ratio. And last but not least, I need to refer back to um, some uh, of the the conventions that I introduced in the last lecture, which is that um, for these um, for these price values that they're all a number greater than zero and that I define it to be in this direction, right? It's the, the token divided by the US dollar value or by its euros value or pesos value, it doesn't really matter. And we do that so that when we um, take the, the ratio of these two prices, um, we end up with the, the marginal price formula. So for example, um, if we're taking PETH over PBTC, the, uh, we'll end up with 10 ETH over one BTC, which matches up with our, um, the way that we've defined the marginal price. I showed you um, at the end of last lecture that there is a way that we can take all of those, price, those prices and compute um, all of the coordinates for all of the tokens, no matter the number of dimensions, which is an extremely helpful thing to have because it's how we performed arbitrage um, when we were running these things. And I've showed you um, during this lecture that the class that I have in Python can do this on, um, um, you know, on, a, on a liquidity pool that has an arbitrary amplification level. And so this is the, the question. I want you to show that for any X, uh, balance where that X balance is zero, that the highest possible price for that token is equal to this expression. And for, um, for that same token, where that token's balance is equal to its intercept, that the minimum possible price is equal to this expression. This is extremely difficult. Um, and this is the, the um, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the equation. So you've got the light at the end of the tunnel. So you've actually got all of the information that you would need if you wanted to create, for example, a class method to perform arbitrage. 
but that's not going to make you any smarter, right? I, I give these equations out to people all the time and they they will never build a protocol. The question is, how did I get to this answer? And it's a, it's a long path, um, or at least the, the way that I did it was a long path. Um, I know that there's a, a you know, that there are some among you who are, um, you know, exceptionally well versed in, in mathematics, and you may be able to get there relatively quickly. But the challenge is um, to get to the answer, not to know what the answer is. And then last but not least, how should LP token issuance and redemption be handled in the system? Right? There is, um, and the, I put this one last, suggesting that it's the most challenging because there's no right answer. Um, there is just, a, it really comes down to what do you think the, the, the purpose of your protocol is? Um, I, in terms of financially, I have a, a view of what, um, what the fair token issuance is and token redemption policy should be. Um, but it's something to think about. And I think as a, you know, a bonding curve research group and the kind of work that you guys do with, you know, finding non-financial, um, you know, applications for, for bonding curves and things, this is, I think, the kind of question that would be much better suited to like an essay, right? Something where um, the actual, um, you know, the, the intent of the, the protocol and, and its builder um, becomes a, you know, a part of the policy of how the LP tokens are issued and so forth. Um, so in a way, I think that this is the most challenging, not because it's mathematically challenging, but because it really comes back to what is the, the philosophy and motivation of, um, of the protocol. Um, and so very, you know, very, very difficult indeed. Okay, and that brings us to um, the end of concentrated liquidity. Um, the, the next lecture is going to be exotic bonding curve types. I will be revisiting um, some of the concentrated liquidity concepts that we presented in this lecture. Um, particularly how it relates to, um, so we will derive the Uniswap v3 um, swap equation from the stuff that I presented today. I'm also going to derive the carbon equations, um, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, the protocol that we've released um, this year, um, carbon is a, an asymmetric bonding curve system where um, it, 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 it has aspects of concentrated liquidity in it, um, but um, it is a it, it is a one dimensional trading system. So it's the only bonding curve I think ever um, you know, ever deployed in a at least in a financial sense, where um, the rate of exchange is dependent only on the token's own balance. There is no reference to another token. Um, and from that position, you realize that you've got like the the smallest indivisible component of a bonding curve, and you can assemble that into sort of n numbers of dimensions and things like that. So we will be going um, over those concentrated liquidity examples. Um, and I'm going to try and do that relatively quickly. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at the solidly stable swap, the curve uh, V1 in um, stable swap invariant. Um, and then also um, my, uh, my own um, approximation, or let's say, I don't know, contender to, to these paradigms. Um, and we'll, we'll look at what their properties are. I'm going to try and make the you know, lecture four a little bit um, Hopefully not as um, not as long as the the previous three have been, um, out of respect for everyone's time, um, and also a little bit more um, you know a, a little bit more hands on. Um, I'm going to try and um, yeah, I, I haven't decided how I'm going to do it yet, but I, I'm trying to think of a way that we can sort of uh, all share our screens or you know use Desmos together or something. Uh, it's probably sort of overreaching, and maybe I'll, I'll just settle for a. Um, you know, a lecture like the ones that I've given before, but um, I don't know, maybe we'll follow it up with a workshop or something like that. Anyway, uh, thank you all for your time. I hope that you found that um, beneficial and I'd um, be very happy to, uh, to accept any questions.